Well, amen. It's great to be here with you all today. Um, it's good to meet some of you in person for the first time. Um, I've known you through the internet, through online. It's good to meet some of you who I've known for a long time, or I'll see you again. And, and of course, it's good to meet people I've never met before ever, whether through online or in person. And I'm just really thankful for this conference in general. It's something I've been praying for and about for a very, very long time. And I'm thankful for all the work that was put into it. Thank you for your labor of love in that. Praise the Lord for that. And I know it's been a blessing to me so far. And hopefully it's been a blessing to you. Before I get into the message uh, I have for you uh, this afternoon, I want to share a quick testimony of how I got involved in open-air preaching. You know, when you see people who have been preaching for a while, you have to realize that's not where they've always been. You know, this is what they are now. It's not what they were 10, 15 years ago. And the first time I opened Air Priest, it was 1999. It was two years in the faith at this point. And I was downtown Greensboro, North Carolina, with this guy who was a backwoods redneck who knew the Bible like the back of his hand. I mean, he knew the Bible really well. And he invited me to come out into the street to minister to these college campus, these college students who were in downtown Greensboro on a Friday night, partying, getting drunk, going to the clubs. And I was witnessing one-to-one -one with people, you know, passing out tracks. And I just began to have a great burden within me. And I had, for the first time in my life, I had this Jeremiah 29 experience. And, that verse says, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. And really, if I were to describe the heart of the open air preacher, that would be it in one verse right there. That the word of God is a burden within you, and you gotta let it out. You gotta tell the people what the word of God says. And it lasted about five minutes. I mean, I had no plans to open air preach that night. I didn't go out there thinking I was going to do that. I didn't, uh, you know, start up uploading videos to YouTube at that point in time. Um, I didn't preach open air again for years, but God did something within me in that moment in time. And I just want to give a word of encouragement to those of you who are new. Maybe you're new to open air preaching. Maybe you haven't open air preached at all. Is you need to make sure you keep that burden alive, that you don't let that go away, let that slip away with all the wickedness you see around you, that's striving to harden your heart towards the lost, to harden your heart towards God uh, because of all the wickedness you see. Let that, let that fire continue to burn within you, to have the right motive to go out there. You know, like Brother Israel was saying earlier, earlier not to just check off the boxes, but because you have this burden in your heart that God has given you that you need to let it out. So let's, let's go ahead and, and just want to share the testimony for those of you who are, who are new. Hopefully that will be encouraging to you. And uh, let's, let's just pray. I just thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, so much for this conference. Thank you, Lord, for the people who are here. Thank you, Lord, that they care about you and the lost. Thank you, Father, they have a burden to, to share your word to those who are lost. I pray, Father, as my brother said earlier, they would never forget where they come from. And I pray, Lord, you do a work of love here and unity in here, Lord, that, that no man can come in and destroy the work you want to do here. And that, Father, people be, walk away from here encouraged, edified, exhorted, even rebuked or convicted in some way if they need to be, Lord. And the Holy Spirit, you would have your own way here, as you have so far. Continue to have your own way here, Lord, in people's hearts and minds, Father. And I pray, Lord... Whatever you want me to speak now, Father, I would speak it. That you give me simplicity of speech, clarity of thought. And those who are listening, whether near or far, Lord, would have hearts and ears attuned to hear what you'd have to say to them. Even with just one word, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, days are getting darker and darker. The world is growing more and more lawless, as Matthew 24 says. And... As you go out into public places to preach, I'm sure you can see this. People are more openly flaunting their abominations more than we've ever seen before. They're saying more outrage, outrageously blasphemous things than we've ever heard before. 
the things people were ashamed to do in private 20 years ago, they're unashamed to do in public now. And it's everywhere you look, everywhere you go, you see this. And it's not going to get better anytime soon, if you ask me. Visible Christianity is in a state of extreme apostasy. Even here in the West, you see it. False doctrines accepted by most, and almost no one stands up for truth and righteousness. And I'm, I'm assuming that's why a lot of you are here. Most who profess to be Christians just want to coast through life and be at peace with the world around them, never offending anyone or never getting in trouble with the world. And I've seen lots of people in my last 21 years depart from the faith. Those who claim to be Christians, who seem to be walking on the narrow path to life, get off it and jump onto the broad path. I've seen people go back to their sins, people be turned over to false doctrine. I've seen people betray and slander and lie about their former brothers and sisters in Christ. Let that not become you, friends. Let that not become me. You must be sober-minded. We must not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to because anytime I see someone fall away, I don't think, I don't think to condemn them. I think to pray for them first, but I think that could be me next. Yeah. That could be me next. Are you, are you that humble that you think that about yourself? You know, as we go to, some of you may stand out in front of apostate churches and preach. You may stand out in front of Roman Catholic churches and preach. Well, glory to God. If you're doing it for his glory, praise the Lord. They need to be saved too. But you dare not become like them, friends. So just, just watch yourself. As Hebrews 3.12 says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. You know, 1 Corinthians 10.12 says, Let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Friends, none of us are immune to the dangers and temptations around us. But we can make sure they wage the good warfare and not allow our faith to suffer shipwreck, as 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20 speaks of. If you don't want your faith to become shipwreck, you don't want to become a casualty in this war for men's souls, including our souls, there's a war for our souls too, then we must employ certain weapons that help us to counteract that happening to us. And so I, some of these things, um, as we've seen already, the Lord speaking, the, there might be some repetitive things here. It's not because I'm borrowing from Brother Adam or Brother Israel or from, or from your other brother, Brother Jeff, that spoke earlier. It's just the Lord's trying to speak to us. He's confirming, as Adam said, he's confirming things. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about, this first weapon you must employ to make sure you don't become a casualty is prayer and fasting. You must spend much time, friends, much time in private prayer. Don't let anything get in the way. It's not work. Not money, not family. And listen, if you believe in family, I have eight children in the home. They're my first ministry. My wife's my first ministry. I believe in them, but they're not going to take me away from private prayer because God is first. Don't let your family take you away from private prayer. Don't let hobbies take you away from private prayer. Don't let entertainment and amusement take you away from private prayer and fasting. Don't let church obligations. You're maybe a part of our local church, and maybe you're a minister there. Maybe you have obligations, you're, things you're involved in there. Don't let that take you away from private prayer and fasting. Ministry. Let me say that again. Ministry. Don't let that take you away from ministering to God. Your desire to minister to the lost, your gung-ho, you have zeal that's consuming you. But friends, you dare not forsake private prayer and fasting and then end up getting in the flesh and be just like the people you're preaching to. You dare not become that way. So don't let ministry get in the way. Even sleep. Even sleep. When was the last time you lost some sleep to seek God's face? Come on, friends. Be honest with yourself. Examine yourself. Because listen, there's a war for your soul. For you. The devil's not done with you. In fact, the more you get involved in this kind of ministry, and the more damage you do to his kingdom, the bigger the target is on your back. Yeah. I know it. I've experienced it for myself. If you let anything get in the way of your private prayer time with the Lord, let me tell you something. You will end up falling away. You will end up falling away. 
And uh, this, this thing, like Brother Israel said earlier, it's not a matter of ticking off boxes. Like, I'm going to give you a list. You've got to check it all off every day. I did my prayer today. I did my fasting this week. You know, the, the Pharisees, they fasted twice a week. And they were ungodly as can be. They were hypocrites. That's true. So it's not about ticking off boxes, but I'm going to tell you this, friend. If you don't get in prior prayer and get in fasting, you're not going to make it. It's just going to get infinitely worse. What we see right now, if we're all still here 10 years from now having conferences, we're going to look back and say, man, it was easy back then. It's just going to get worse. And you've got to stay close to the Lord. You've got to stay close to Him in prayer. So I'm not prophesying. I'm not simply telling you by experience, friends. In my own life, the times where I've slipped, the times I've gotten in the flesh, it's because I wasn't giving in this. This was lacking in my life. And I've counseled hundreds of people through the years. And without fail, without fail, I can't think of one person who backslid and went back to their sins or whatever it was where this wasn't lacking. I can't think of one person, friends, where this wasn't lacking. Most times they have zero to little private prayer time. So don't tell me you're serious about your faith and you're serious about my Jesus if you won't take time to pray. Don't tell me you are. Don't just because you're here at this conference, because you go out to the streets and boldly preach God's word does not mean you're serious about my Jesus. You might be serious about rebuking somebody. You might be serious about getting his word out there. But are you serious about the one who gave you the word? How about that? If you won't spend time in prayer, don't tell me you're serious about Jesus. Don't tell me how hard it is to resist temptation if you're not getting in prayer. People will come to me and say, I can't overcome this sin. Well, how much are you involved in prayer? How much are you going to the Lord and seeking his face? Well, none. Don't tell me how hard it is for you to overcome a certain sin when you're not praying. You're not involving yourself in the tools God has given you to overcome those things. Don't tell me how serious. Here's a, here's a serious one right here. I've experienced this myself. Don't tell me how serious you are about walking in the spirit in the open air if you won't pray. Don't tell me how serious you are. But I'm telling you this, you're going to get in the flesh because people get in your face. They say filthy things to you. They do filthy things to you. They want to hurt you and be violent and they will be violent to you. You have cops do all kinds of things to you that are unlawful according to the law of this land and God's law. And the only way you're going to walk in the spirit in those situations is if you're in prayer. It's not some special formula as if some of us have more patience given to us by God than others do intrinsically. It's a matter of getting to the Lord. Staying in prayer with him. And, and if you're there in prayer, don't set a ton of while, just do 10 minutes today. Stay there until God's done with you. Amen. Stay there until God's done dealing with you. Because maybe, maybe he wants you to just be quiet and just talk to you for a while. Maybe he wants to do the talking for once. Instead of you talking to him. So I'm talking about intimate communion with God. I'm not talking about the two-minute prayer you may say before you preach. And I pray before I preach. I'm not saying the corporate prayer you may have before you go out for a half an hour. I'm talking about by yourself. Where there's no one looking. There's no, nothing to puff you up in pride to how good you're praying. Or how much you're weeping in prayer. It's just you and the Lord. There's no puffing up there. There's no fakeness there. It's just you and the Lord. And let me just say, I'm not, going to ask, I'm not asking you to say it out loud. But tell me this. In your head, answer this question. Do you have a private place to go to? If you can't answer that question like that, that tells me you're not praying. Because if you don't even have the place to go to, how can you be going to that place and doing it? we got to have that place, friends, where we can go, where there's no distractions, no smartphone, no computer, no TV, no anybody else that can take our attention away from the one who deserves our undivided attention. And that's God Almighty. So you've got to have that place, friends. We have no excuses, friends. Listen, we all have a life. We all have to work to provide for our family. We all have, some of us have a wife or a husband. Some of us have children. Some of us have other obligations. But listen, there's no excuses to not put God first. I remember this quote from John Wesley. I'm probably going to chop up a little bit. He said something to this effect. He said, if I realized how much I had to do that day, that I didn't have time for prayer, I realized I need to pray even more. He would get up even earlier and pray even earlier because he realized how much of God's help he needed to get the things done that day that he had to get done. On top of prayer, we have fasting. And let me just ask you straight out. When was the last time you fasted, friends? 
answer to God. When was the last time you pushed aside the plate of food and said, I'm putting this on this, the altar right here, and I'm going to search, I'm going to seek after God, I'm going to search for God for food from heaven. Because he wants to do something, friends. You know, in Mark 9, when Jesus came down, they couldn't drive out this, this one demon and this, this young boy. And the disciples said, why, why can't we drive him out? He said, this guy kind of comes out only by prayer and fasting. And so there's, there's spiritual power over demonic forces when you're in fasting and prayer. And I'm going to tell you this. If you're out there laboring in the Lord's harvest field, you're destroying, you're taking back captives from the enemy, you're, getting, you're seeing souls saved, you're seeing souls convicted of their sins, you're demolishing strongholds, demons are going to be after you as well. What I found in my experience, just by experience, when I get done doing something mighty for the Lord, I go preach somewhere and God does a mighty thing, that's what I get attacked the most right afterwards. It's right in there and I attack you. You can't let your guard down. So, but if you're in prayer and fasting, you need to be attuned to those things, a sensitive to those things, and it's not going to be a surprise. You're not going to get knocked off your horse. You're going to keep on going. So there must be, must be a fasting. When was the last time you pushed aside three meals in a row for the Lord? I mean, really, friends, is food really that precious to you? Who is your God? The God above or the belly beneath? Come on, friends. We've got to get serious with God. We've got to stop playing games and just going through the motions and just, oh, okay, I'm going out and I'm preaching the gospel. This, friend, that's not the pinnacle of Christianity. I'm here to tell you. Preaching the gospel in the open air and being bold and rebuking sinners and calling to repentance and people getting in your face and you don't respond, that's not the pinnacle of Christianity. You've got to go a little deeper, friends. And God wants you to go deeper. He wants you to come closer to Him. And fasting and prayer. I know at times when I, when I fast and pray, it's almost like if I can compare at times when I'm normally praying, it's like God's at 20, 30 yards away trying to talk to me. When I get to, to fast and pray, it's like he's whispering in my ear. You're so in tune with what he's trying to say to you, what he wants to speak to you. And so, friends, you must not offer up God the leftovers. Well, I know that steak looks good. Steak, the mashed potatoes, or if you like salad, that floats your boat, or maybe you're a smoothie person. It may look good, it may taste good, but maybe you just got to put it aside, man. You know, Jesus never said fasting was easy, but He calls you to it. He calls you to it. Every single one of you, He's called you to do it. And you ought not hold it back from Him. He deserves the main course, not the lever. He deserves the best that we can give Him. And then there's the Word. So we have prayer and fasting, we have the Word. And we have, Brother Adam is a great example of getting the Word in your heart that you may not sin against him. And that's encouraged me. And I'm going to exhort you. If, you. if you saw what Adam put up today, and he's done a lot. He's put a lot of work and diligence and effort and discipline to that. Don't let that overwhelm you and think, well, I'll never get to that point. Listen, friends, he didn't start there. That's years. Years of work. People ask me, saying, well, how do you memorize it? Well, I started, and I kept on going. That's why I started and I kept on going. I didn't stop. I didn't get to one point and say, well, that's enough. I'll stop right there. That's, that's, that's sufficient to God. No, I'm going to keep on going with God. Now, some may go at a different speed than you may go. You may go 10 miles per hour. You may go 50 miles per hour. But you've got to start and you've got to keep on going. You've got to get in the Word. You must set aside time each day, multiple times a day. You know, the Muslims, they pray five times a day. They dare not be as zealous as we are, friends. All they have is the devil. We have God Almighty. But you need to read it. You need to study it. You need to memorize it, as Brother Adam showed. You need to believe it and obey it. And these days, I oftentimes have people email me and say, well, my, fact, my, my faith is just struggling. I'm, I feel like I'm wavering from the faith. And I said, well, how much are you in the Word? And there's very little time in the Word. But the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Well, how is your faith going to grow, friends, if you're not getting in the Word? And not just reading it. I mean, you ought to read it. I mean, you ought to get through the Bible every year. You ought to get through the Bible at least once. Come on, let's not play games here. How much time are you spending on other things? In the Word, one year. I mean, one time I read through the whole Word in 88 days. That's not to boast in me. It's just to prove to you one year is nothing. It's nothing to read through the Bible once every year. And that gets it in your heart and mind. Then you spend time studying it. God may lead you to study a certain topic. 
And then you memorize as well, as Brother Adam showed earlier. So mo most people's faith, are just, some people's faith are just starving because they're not getting in the Word. And I'm going to tell you this, one of the greatest schemes of the enemy, and we're not ignorant of the schemes, right? Not to be ignorant of the devil's schemes. One of the greatest schemes he has in his last days? Distraction. Amen. Distraction. Yeah. He might not get you to, to, uh, to go smoke some weed. He might not get you to get drunk, to fornicate, to look at pornography. He might not get you to lie and to steal. He might not get you to embezzle money from work. But listen, if he can get you distracted, he's got you right where he wants you. Amen. He gets you distracted, gets you off track from where you really should be, where your time and attention, your mind should be. And he gets you off track, and then eventually, you're going to look back and say, where did I, how did I get here? How far have I fallen? Slowly but surely over time, because you've been distracted. So beware of distractions, friends. And he would seek to distract you from getting in the Word. If he can get you distracted by that, you're going to be in trouble. And eventually you'll give in to one of the bigger sins. So there's prayer and fasting, there's the Word, and then we're, you know, we're all here because we love evangelism. Why is it important? Because soldiers don't sit on the sideline and do nothing. Okay? I was in the army at one point in time, and if, if there was a war going on and you sat on the sideline and did nothing, they consider you a traitor. You need to get in the fight. And when there's millions of casualties falling on every side, and devils wreaking havoc, destroying men's souls, taking a ground every day, a soldier gets in the battle and fights. He lays down his life for the fight. And if he isn't getting in the battle, and he isn't fighting, well, someday the battle's going to come to him. And when the battle comes to him, because he wasn't training, he wasn't in the fight, he's not going to be ready. And he's going to become a casualty of the war as well. But we've got to get in there and fight. And if, if you're not uh, getting in the battle and fighting now, when it's lightweight. This is lightweight, friends. I mean, we, we look at Matthew 24, we see the birth pangs. But I'm telling you right now, my wife is giving birth to seven children in my presence. The birth pangs get worse. They don't get easier. They get worse. And that's a sign the baby's about to come. And someday God's kingdom's going to come. But until then, it's just going to get worse, friends. If you're not in the lightweight battle, you're not in kindergarten, you're not in first grade and second grade, how do you expect to get, go to college and graduate with a PhD? That's what God wants for you. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to endure to the end. Not fall right before the finish line. What a shame that would be, man. What, how, how, what a shame it would be for someone to train for so many years to run in a race. And then they give up right before the end. But hey, the enemy doesn't care when you give up. It could be now. It could be the end. He's out for your soul, though. But I'm assuming everybody here is in the battle. I'm assuming that. But just, just, just in case, just in case you're not getting in the battle, just in case you're not consistently out there evangelizing like you ought to be, let me ask you some questions. When was the last time you made a concerted effort to get out there? I'm not talking about just going as you do it, you know, go about your life and passing out tracks, but actually getting out there. You took, you sacrificed time, you sacrificed whatever you skater and just got out there. When was the last time that even though it was just you, nobody's with you, you just went out anyway. It doesn't matter. There's no one else where they couldn't go, but God was calling you to go, and you went out anyway. The last time you did that. I mean, we don't have to have someone with us, right? Because someone's always with us. And no matter how many we're against, one man with God on his side is always in the majority. Always in the majority. When was the last time you had to overcome some fears or looking foolish for Jesus to preach the gospel? Or when was the last time you suffered for the gospel's sake? Because these are all things that try to deter us. Oh, I have no one to go with me. Oh, I just don't feel like it. Oh, I got these fears. Oh, I don't feel like suffering. These are all things that deter us from getting out there. But God calls us to be overcomers. And listen, beyond all of this, getting into battle and being trained for the future, God commands it, and that's all there is to it. That's enough. Should be good enough. And then the fourth one is the one I'm going to focus on the rest of this time is consistent fellowship with other saints and discipleship. Friends, I know we're in an age of, of, of apostasy. I know there are very few local churches out there that are good and godly. I know there probably isn't one solid denomination out there. I know that pastors are compromised on every side. I know there are megachurches all around that are just businesses profiting off a facade of Christianity 
and the Word of God. And most people just lap it up, having their ears tickled. They love it. I know that most local churches don't engage in biblical evangelism, let alone support others who do. I know that most local churches' evangelism consists in inviting people to a building and having a harvest festival on October 31st. I know that most churches are given over to all manner of false teachings and sin-approving doctrines, yet with all this in mind, what does it have to do with you and me? What, what, what does the apostasy have to do with you and me if we're not apostate? Why should we compromise what God's Word says about fellowship, what God's Word says about discipleship, if we're not apostate ourselves? Amen. Should we let the apostasy stop us from being what God has called us to be? I don't think so. How does that change God's mind or God's command for us to meet on a consistent basis? How does it change the example we see in Scripture and the book of Acts and the epistles? How does any of this change the Great Commission, which, just to remind you, includes discipleship? It includes discipleship. Christianity was never meant to be this model where you preach and just move on and that's it. There's no, no discipleship involved. It's an integral part of everything. And if you don't make time to disciple people, guess what? People will never get discipled. We'll never have the next generation raised up. We must multiply who we are. Otherwise, what we're doing, our labor will mostly be in vain because we're not multiplying disciples for God's glory. So has God made things impossible for us that we can't obey Him in these situations? That we can't have consistent, godly fellowship with other saints and discipleship? What's the problem? Well, maybe part of it is ignorance. Maybe part of it is lacking guidance on what to do. Another part may be a lack of a good model to follow. And just to give you a hint, the model we see for the most part is not a good model to follow. Another part could be distractions and priorities in the wrong place. It could be a fear or discomfort of opening up your life to someone else. Maybe they'll see your hypocrisy. Maybe let's say you're wearing a mask. You're just kind of playing games. Maybe there's a fear of discomfort or open up your life to someone because of things that have happened to you in the past. Maybe it's just comfort in you being where you are in your faith right now. It could be something as simple as a lack of commitment to God's plan for your life. So I want to read you some scriptures now, and I want you to really meditate upon it. Let's turn to Hebrews 10, verse 23. And let's meditate upon what God wants to say through these verses to us. And let's, let's align our minds. We want to look at our mind. Let's align our minds with what God's Word says. Okay, because when God tells us to do something, there's nothing in this world that can stop us from doing it. Because God gives the command, He gives the ability to fulfill the command. Amen? So Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For He who promised is faithful. Amen. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. So let's, let's start with what it says. It says, consider one another. Who are you considering? You know, when it comes to fellowship, we all need each other. There's, there's no lone range out there they're going to make. He may point to John the Baptist, some of the prophets, but that, you know, God's word for us is we're meant to be with other Christians. Yeah. We're meant to be with each other, not by ourselves. It's not God's will for us. So who are you considering when you're, when you're being a lone ranger? Are you considering anybody else? Are you even considering yourself when you're being a lone ranger? We have one body. We have many parts. What gift, as Adam alluded to earlier, what gift is someone else missing out on because you have it and you're not giving it to them? What gift are you missing out on because you're not involved with other people for whatever reason and they have a gift to bestow upon you? What are you missing out on? You know, here, you know, I, like, I liken to the, the, the evangelists, the, the preachers of the gospel, and the, the people who are concerned about open air preaching and witnessing. We're like the feet. But all we have in here is a bunch of feet. This is not God's will. I mean, this is good. This is edifying. This is encouraging. Praise the Lord that this was put on and we all can be here. But we're not meant just to be with, around with a bunch of feet. We're meant to be with hands and arms and, and ears and eyelashes. They're important too to keep the sand out of your eyes. Very small part, but keep the sand out of your eyes. You know, we're meant to be with the body of Christ. So you need to consider one another. And what does fellowship does? It stirs up love and good works. Man, that sounds good to me. I want to be stirred up to love and good works. 
I don't want to be by myself. It's not what God meant for me to be. But in order for that to happen, we must not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Mm. And then there's exhorting one another. Exhort is like a, it's almost like a rebuke, but no one's committed a sin yet. So you're strong, exhort, a strong encouragement not to do a certain thing. And we need that, friends. We need that strong exhortation from our brothers and sisters in Christ to exhort us. Don't go this way. Because as they see our lives, they see what we're doing, what our life is like, they can see things, as we said earlier, that we may not see ourselves. And they can help us in that. And look, it says, so much the more, not less. You see, this wicked world is getting wicked. The day is approaching. Doesn't mean you fellowship less. Doesn't mean you make excuses for yourself not to fellowship. So much the more. You know, as this gets worse, you're going to need people even more. You're going to need the saints even more. And I'm going to tell you this, we talked about the word and prayer and fasting and how you, if you don't get into those things, you're probably going to fall away eventually. Same thing with this. You're going to end up falling away, man. If you're by yourself alone, you're probably going to fall away. And you need to take this seriously. So we see this as the day approaches, we do it more, not less. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Brother Adam alluded to this passage earlier, but it was already in my notes from days ago. The Lord trying to confirm some things to us. Ephesians 4, verse 11. It says, And Jesus himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So God has these offices that he's put in place, these callings he's given to men to be these things. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. I don't know about you, but I want to be equipped. I don't want to go out to the battle of the water gun, man. Oh God, they're the, the, the best weapons I can have. And I, I, even I need equipping. I need to be equipped. And there's people who can equip me in ways that I can't equip myself. Relying upon myself. So equipping the saints for the work of ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. I want to be edified. You know, there's all kinds of things that are to discourage. They seek to discourage you and put you down and make you depressed and harden your heart against the world. But this says you can be edified. Praise the Lord. Till we all come to the unity you know, I've been involved in lots of divisions, lots of disunity. I love unity. Amen. I love the unity of the brethren. It's, just, it's so good to dwell in unity, the scripture says. Amen. It's a joy for me to see other like-minded brothers and sisters here who are interested in dwelling together in unity. But that's, this is available in a local body of Christ. Not a one-time-a-year thing. It's available every day, all throughout the week. Every week it's available to you if you'll do as God commands you to do. And it goes on to say, We all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, oh, I want that, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children. Listen, we need to grow up in Christ. Amen. Not be children tossed to and fro. And one of the ways God has made us to do this is when He gives certain offices, certain callings of people to edify you, to equip you. To make sure you don't stay children, that you're not tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him, which is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. Every joint's important. According to the effective work in which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This is the church right here. This is what the church is meant to be. Now I love evangelism conferences. That's not evangelism conferences right there. This is a local church that God calls you to be a part of. Acts chapter 2. We're going to see what the early church was like. See their characteristics. Acts chapter 2 verse 42. Day of Pentecost. Peter preaches one sermon. He has all this preparation of prayer for two weeks. You see what preparation and prayer will do to your sermons, preachers? 3,000 get saved. I'm not guaranteeing anything, but I'll tell you, preparation and prayer does something for your sermons. Acts 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly. So the steadfastness, they continuing steadfast, not lazily, not, oh, I can't make it today because this is happening, or I got this going on, making all the excuses in the book for why you can't gather together, steadfastly continued in the apostles' doctrine. Where is that found? Right here. Continued in the Bible. In the Bible's doctrine. And 
fellowship. So listen, friends, you can, you can continue in the Word, like I said earlier, you continue in prayer and fasting, but if you're not in fellowship, this is the example we're given. They continue steadfastly in fellowship. And the breaking of bread. What's breaking of bread? It's communion. And what does communion do? Well, if you take communion in a biblical sense, if you read 1 Corinthians 11 and you know what it says, it's to check yourself. To make sure you're not eating and drinking judgment upon yourself. That's what the scripture says. So you examine your heart, examine yourself. Am I, am I in the faith? And I'll tell you, when we do that every week, take communion every week, it's, it'll check you, man. You, you got some things you got to get right with God. You better get them right now, otherwise you're going to eat and drink judgment upon yourself. And so communion is important. And they continued in prayer. So we talked about prior prayer earlier being important, but corporate prayer is important too. It's encouraging to me to hear the prayers of the saints on my behalf. That I know someone's praying for. They got my back. They're concerned about me. They're carrying my burdens with me. And it's an encouragement for me to keep on going. It gives me zeal. So then fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. There's a like-mindedness there. They were together. And had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. I like what Brother Kevin said earlier. He was talking about how he opens his house up for hospitality. And he says he doesn't want to leave anything behind. doesn't want a savings account. doesn't want the retirement. He wants to leave everything behind to use it for the Lord's account. These people are doing the same thing. So question. If God calls you to, uh, you maybe you have three cars, but you only really need one. And maybe God says, well, give that car to that brother or sister. What are you going to say to God? You're going to say Yes. Because this, this is what we see in the early church. We see them giving up as someone had need. You have need, you meet. And it's, it's, listen, if you're by yourself now and you have needs, like, man, I wish I had someone to help me. Well, get in a godly fellowship. That's what it's there for. To bear each other, to care for each other, to be there for each other's needs. I can't tell you how many times it's, it's worked both ways. People are there for me, I've been there for other people. And it's always encouraging to have that there because it shows someone a tangible picture of the love of the Lord. Because you can tell someone to your, to your blue in the face, God loves you, God loves you. But I'll tell you, if you show them in person, they believe it even more. They see it working through you. And so there's a love there. There's a caring for each other. So continuing daily. Now, I'm not, I'm not expecting everyone to meet daily, but I'm going to tell you this. It wouldn't be beyond the Bible. We went beyond the Word of God for you to meet even daily. I mean, we like to chop our life up and say, well, Sunday, I'll give a couple hours to the Lord and to this body over here, but the rest of the week is for me. No, man, it all belongs to the Lord. And I'll tell you this, true fellowship, you're all up in each other's business. Okay? You're not putting a face mask on once a week and being able to fool somebody. You know what they're like. There's no hiding stuff. You know what they're like. You know their strengths and their weaknesses. And that's good. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Because if you have it, don't you want it to be dealt, dealt with? Don't you want your weaknesses to be dealt with? Or do you want to stay weak the rest of your life? And God uses people to help people overcome those things. Namely, the body of Christ. So they continue daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. So they're in each other's houses. When was the last time you invited someone to your house for a meal? A brother or sister in Christ. Just to spend time with them. Just to, just to see how their life's going. Ask them about the work. Ask them, how can I pray for you? What can I pray for you today? And doing the same thing. Then. So, well, I have this deal. Can you, can, you, can you pray for me about this? They're in each other's houses. Breaking bread from house to house. Eating food together. They are worshiping God. They are praising God together. And look at what the result is. The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. And this is not some formula, but I'll tell you this. If we're going to be a church like God expects to, the church God's coming back for, this is what it looks like, friends. This is what it looks like. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it says this, Brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritually restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, part of fulfilling the law of Christ and being in a local fellowship is that you're bearing each other's burdens. Because who bore, who, who bore our sin burden? Jesus did. And he's, he's given us a commission to bear each other's burdens. And 
And listen, if you see someone going astray, go after them and say, listen, man, you've got to stop this and try to restore them in a spirit of gentleness. So what is God's ideal church? What does it look like? What is it consistent? We've seen a lot of things in these passages we just went through. It's a group of believers who consistently meet together on a regular basis, not just once a week because they're too busy for anything else. Okay? Not limiting God to that. If that's you, I suggest you cut some unnecessary things from your life and, and get your schedule on God's plan. They pray together. They study the Word together, the Apostles' Doctrine. They are like-minded in unity. They worship God together, praising God. They take communion together, breaking of bread. They eat together from house to house. They carry those burdens. And when there's a need, whether it be financial, spiritual, emotional, physical, they're there to help out. They keep each other accountable by exhorting one another. And if they turn away, try to turn them back. Uh, turn them back. They rebuke and correct each other when someone is needed, stirring up to love and good works. They weep together and pray together over the lost. They go out together preaching to the lost. They suffer together as one local body. Their children grow up together and become the next generation of leaders in the church. They do life together and know each other in an intimate way, not in a shallow, one hour a week, put on a face mask kind of way. They allow freedom and preferences, whether it's doctrinal or doubtful things. They will be qualified biblical leadership over them. People will be in submission to that leadership and will honor it. The leadership will serve the body of Christ through teaching, through equipping, through training, through unifying, through vision, through discipleship, through guidance, through counseling, through being good examples to follow, and training up future leaders. There will be order in the church. There will be deacons who will serve the body, take the burden off the pastors who are ministering. And this is what God wants out of you and me. This is what God wants out of every Christian. I'm going to tell you this, lots of people are settling for less than the best. They're settling for substitutes. They settle for a natural family. Well, listen, I mean, I don't know about you, most of my natural family is not Christian. Okay, I was the first Christian in my family. I looked back generations, couldn't find one. My mom's now a Christian. But even her, I'm not substituting my fellowship with the saints, a local body, with my mother who lives seven hours away from me. I'm not substituting that. And there's no substitute. I mean, who did Jesus say were his brother, sister, and mother. Those who keep the commandments of God. Those that, that's your true family. And you've grown up with your natural family. You've been around them all your life. But listen, if they're not saved and you're hanging around them more than you hang around the church of God, you're going to end up straying with them because you're unequally yoked with unbelievers. Internet church. In this day and age, listen, I put videos on YouTube. I hope people watch them. But I'll tell you this, internet church is not biblical. It is not God's will. It may be a sufficient substitute for a period of time, but it's not to be seen as a permanent substitute. And we have a perfect example of why that shouldn't be the case. Brother Adam's channel got taken down recently, right? What if you couldn't get it back up? What's everybody who's watching his videos going to do then? They're relying upon him. And like, just like God told him, and I say amen to it, let them rely upon me, God says. And God's perfect plan. You see, the, the, YouTube can do whatever they want to do. Twitter can do whatever they want to do. Whatever they're out, they can do whatever they want to do. It can all come crashing down. Then what will you have, friends? If you don't have the local body God intends you to have, intends for you to have, then there's conference like we have here today. These are wonderful, they're godly, they're refreshing, they stir up zeal within me, but it's not a replacement. Especially since it's only like once a year, maybe twice a year. These are not replacements for a local body. They have things like people engaging in homesteading or food groups. You know, there's all kinds of diets out there today, whether it's, you know, back in my day, the Atkins diet, Plexus, Keto, THM, low carb, count calories. And people find this one similarity with somebody, whether it's the homesteading thing or it's the diet thing, they'll still just latch on to it. They find this one thing in common with someone, but they, they won't go to this other local body because they disagree on one doctrine. Something wrong with that, friends. These people are not to be replaced. So, so you might find some camaraderie with people who are losing weight like you are, or who are deciding to grow their own food and be self-sufficient. But that's not a replacement for the church of God, who the head is Christ. Christ not the head of some diet group. Christ not the head of some homesteading group. He's the head of the body of Christ. Then there's political groups. Listen, I'm not political. 
I'll tell you straight up, but I don't really care what you are, Republican, Democrat, liberal, uh, Trump, libertarian, whatever, conservative, whatever you want to call yourself. That's not a replacement for the body of Christ either. And there's lots of people who are being turned aside and they're just, just completely far gone now. Because they'll, they'll preach Trump more than they preach Jesus. Shame on us if we preach him more than we preach Jesus. He doesn't deserve our allegiance. Jesus deserves our allegiance. So that's not, that's not the substitute either. And then there's conspiracy groups. People follow Alex Jones. There are all kinds of conspiracy. Listen, man, we know the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He got some conspiracy we'll never know about. Millions of them. But God forbid I spend more time looking into the devil's work than being involved in the God and God's work. Right. Conspiracy theories are nothing to what the Word of God says. You can't get all caught up in that and spend hours figuring these conspiracies, elaborate conspiracies out and then never even really come to the knowledge of the truth on it. But God has His truth and God has His church who He's ahead of. Then there's apostate church. I'm not telling you Listen very clear. I'm not telling you to go to apostate church. I'm not telling you to go to a church that is turned aside to false doctrine and wickedness. I'm not telling you that. There's lots of denominations, lots of compromise doctrinally and morally. So that's obviously the answer either. And there's other groups. You may have sports groups, hobbies, whatever. But the big question is this, friends. Will you have it God's way or your way? That's the only question you've got to answer right now when it comes to local fellowship, godly fellowship, consistent fellowship. Will you have it God's way or your way? Or are you just going to be lazy and not put the work into it that it happens? You know, Brother Adam put a lot of work into the scripture memorization. He put a lot of work into that. Can't take that away from him. And if you don't do that work, you don't want to blame it yourself. Same thing with this, friends. You can sit back and complain that all the churches are apostate and they're all wicked and, and they're all just messed up. But then you do nothing to provide a church for yourself, a local church. You do nothing to become a part of one. And obviously, people have asked me these questions in the past, and there's, there's several, several possible solutions. You can, one, you can go join a group that you already know of. And people say, well, I live, in, I live in Michigan. I can't move all the way to Florida and join Team Jesus Preachers Church. Well, why not? Why not? You, you'll, you'll move for jobs, right? You'll move for a paycheck. You move for families. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll move for all kinds of things, but you won't move to be a part of a biblical church in this wicked age we're living in? You must not care about your soul if you're not willing to do that. So that's, that's answer number one. But maybe, maybe God doesn't, isn't calling you to do that. I'm not saying everybody has to do that. Maybe God not calling you to do that. Answer number two, you continue to pray and fast and look for one. Don't, don't think because you went to 10, 15, 50 churches and God's called you to stay right where you are that you're to give up. You better keep looking, man. You better keep looking. This is Christ's bride that he's ahead of. And he deserves to be searched after. And there's a third answer. The third answer is you start one yourself. Okay, and I'm not saying that because you start one, you're a pastor. Or you're, you're called to be a leader. But listen, friends, you look in the, the, the book of Acts, you look in the New Testament... They didn't start ideally. I mean, ideally we would have deacons and elders and it'd be a, you know, you might have a separate building. But listen, things don't start out ideal. It may start out as a Bible study where you gather together and you look, open the word together. You read it. You talk about it. You memorize it. Together, you do the memorization games to make sure you're staying on top of things. You know, you're going to worship God together in song. You're going to pray together. You'll eat together. Does any of that take special skills? Does any of that mean you have to be a church leader to do it? Maybe all God will use you to do is to start something and he'll bring a leader along later on. Or maybe God will raise up a leader from your midst. I, I truly believe God has a word for someone here today. I'm gonna, just going to say it. Someone here, maybe many people here are called to be a pastor and have not fulfilled that calling yet. That God is calling you to get out of your comfort zone. Because listen, man, all the apostasy around, we, we're not going to be able to go into Joel Osteen's church and change his mind, okay? He's not changing his mind. We can stand outside and try to reach those who are going in there, but he's not changing his mind. And so if every, all the most are apostate, well, listen, that doesn't change what God's Word says. It's time to start something new. Not new in the sense that it's never happened before, but new in the sense that it's what the Bible says. 
what the Bible says. So we need to start thinking about that and considering that. You need to really seriously consider that, friends, and check your heart and see if God wants you to do it. Because God doesn't want you going to an apostate church. God doesn't want you to be by yourself. And if he hasn't called you to move, well, this is the only option you've got left, friends. And I'll tell you this, when I go out into, when I first started our home fellowship, you know how God brought people to me? It wasn't necessarily from the local area. I would go out there and preach, and God would send people, and they would say, well, I want to be involved in this. And then they would come join. People would watch the videos. They'd move to where we were. These kind of things happen. You, you never know how God, and God might not do it that way with you. That's the way he did it with me. And God may do something different with you, but you need to get in fellowship, consistent, godly fellowship, where you get disciple and you're able to disciple others as well. So even though we may not start ideal, even Paul told Titus in Titus 1, go back to all the cities we labor in and appoint elders, which means they didn't have one. So not everything's a start ideal, but we need to start something, friends. We can't start, can't keep giving in to substitutes which God has not given us. We need to Go for God's ideal, God's perfect, God's best. Otherwise, when it comes, it keeps getting worse and worse, we're just going to fall away, friends. And I want that to happen to me. I want that to happen to you. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the saints. Thank you for your people who are part of your body. And I pray, Father, my message today does not fall on deaf ears, and you speak the words to those you want to speak to, Lord. It will not return to you void. If I said anything wrong, Lord, you just swipe, swipe it from their mind, Lord. They wouldn't even remember it. To get me out of the way and just have your messes permeate in people's hearts and minds today. I glorify you, Lord, for all you've done and for all you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name I pray.